So our next speaker is astronaut Chris Hadfield, and there will be a video that introduces him far better than I could. So please, Chris Hatfield. Il est devenu une véritable vedette planétaire grâce aux centaines de photos qu'il a publiées sur les réseaux sociaux depuis l'espace. Добрый день! When you're outside on a spacewalk, you're thinking about a lot of things. But one of the things that you don't want to have happen is to have a piece of space junk crash into you. Because you're just wearing a suit of cloth. So how big a threat is space junk? And what should we do about it? If you look at you know, the history of the world, for the first four and a half billion years, we didn't have any space junk. We hadn't put anything into orbit. But just a couple of years before I was born, we figured out how to launch a rocket into space. This was the uh, R7 rocket. And what it carried into space in October of 1957 was a thing about a little smaller than a basketball. It weighed about the same as I weigh, and we decided to call it Sputnik, little, little traveler, fellow voyager. And Sputnik changed everything. It began orbital debris. It began space junk. It only stayed in orbit for about three months before its orbit decayed and it burned up in the atmosphere. But we said, wow, if we could put Sputnik up there, then we could put communication satellites up and weather satellites and spy satellites and navigation equipment, all kinds of stuff, maybe even people up there. And so since 1957, we have put a lot of stuff into orbit around the world. Now, actually, when you look at that, each piece is about the size of your fist or smaller. So don't really believe how that looks because in order to make those dots big enough for you to see, they'd have to be about the size of Bratislava. You know, and nothing's that big. So, but just picture that each one of those dots is maybe the size of your fist. So another way to look at that is how many things have we launched since the start of the space program? And the green line is everything. Look over the last couple of years. We've had a radical increase because the cost of rockets has gotten way cheaper. And so SpaceX is putting up thousands of communication satellites to give everybody in the world internet and be able to use your cell phone. So we're putting a lot more stuff up there. 
And it's not just that we put it there, like those things we saw, but sometimes they run into each other. And in 2009, these two old things crashed into each other, and they turned two satellites into 2,000 pieces of debris, some of which are still up there right now. So collisions are really bad. And then some of the bigger governments have said, well, what if we want to shoot an enemy satellite down, like we shoot down their drones or we shoot down their airplanes? And you can understand that. We call those anti-satellite weapons. And uh, the Soviet Union started that in the 70s, and then the Americans in the 80s and 2000s, and then the Chinese launched one, and the Indians launched one, and the Russians launched one. And the trouble is an anti-satellite weapon turns one satellite into thousands of pieces. And if you look, this is just the debris up there. And look at that pink line. Look what happened in, in 2008. When we went, when the Chinese launched their anti-satellite weapon, it increased the number of pieces of debris by like 25% in one second. So any satellite weapons contribute to the debris up there as well. And this is the mess we're dealing with. So how big a threat is it, really, now that we know and can start to count all the pieces up there? Well, if you live on board the space station, like I had a chance to, you think about it. You don't want a piece to come through the wall. When you go to the window and you look out at the world, if you look really closely at the window, that, that's where a little piece of debris crashed into the window and left a little ding in the window. And if you look at our huge solar arrays, if you look carefully there on the left, you can see what looks like a bullet hole in the solar array. And not too recently, in the great big robot arm, the cannon arm that, that I helped build during my spacewalks on my second space flight, uh, a piece of debris went through it and tore a hole in the cannon arm. So eventually, a piece of debris will kill everybody on the space station, eventually. So the real question is, how soon, how can we predict it, and what can, what can we do about the problem? And, you know, when you look at this, are there any examples of how we have dealt with this sort of problem in the past? And interestingly, uh, last summer was in history, the busiest airplane traffic day in our history, in, in the world. On that one day, last July, these are all commercial airplane flights, 135,000 airplanes flew in our atmosphere. There's only 86,000 seconds in a day. So that means there was another airliner taking off, you know, more than one a second almost to a second, and yet none of them ran into each other, even though they're just in a tiny little sliver of the atmosphere. And the reason they didn't run into each other, all those 135,000, is because we designed them to be safe, we planned their flights so that everybody knows about their flights, um, when they're in flight, we can track where they're going. We have good uh, tracking systems to keep exactly knowing where they are. And if they're going to run into something else, they can maneuver. And they have a planned landing. They don't all launch and stay up in, in the air forever. So how can we take those ideas and apply it to orbital debris? Well, if we look at the equivalent of just keeping track of where they are, there's private companies now, like Leo Labs, that build these huge satellite tracking antenna all around the world. So we can keep track of, uh, of where they all are so that maybe we could predict if one's going to run into another, and then maybe you can maneuver to avoid each other. But if you're going to maneuver, how often are you going to have to maneuver? And I commanded the International Space Station on my third space flight. What that you're looking at here is years across the bottom, a number of times the space station had to maneuver to avoid a piece of space junk that someone noticed from the ground. If you look, the worst year ever in 2014, we had to move the space station five times to miss a piece of junk. But the year that I was the commander, 2013, we never moved it once. And from 2016, 2017, 2018, 19, four years went by 
where we never even had to move the biggest thing in space once. So it's a big problem, but obviously it's not like at, at the worst critical point right now. It's something that we want to deal with now. Make the right decisions, just like we've done with aviation, so that we don't get ourselves into a much worse situation. You know, how are, how are we going to deal with it? But it's not just human-made space junk. The world gets hit by natural space junk. While I was living on the space station, this big rock, it was about 20 meters across, came through the atmosphere by Chelyabinsk. And if you total it up, every single day, 45 tons of rock falls out of the sky. The Earth gets hit by 45 tons of rock, of, of naturally occurring space debris every single day. All the elements, all the metals, all everything that's out there hits the world every single day. So you need to think about that because every gram of that came past the space station and came past every single satellite that's up there. And it's not just rock falling from the sky and landing in places like Antarctica where you can go pick up the meteorites just sitting there on the ice. But it's also electromagnetic energy that falls from the sky. Like these big solar arrays, or I'm seeing solar flares and co coronal mass ejections that, that come out of the sun. And they make beautiful skies over Bratislava. It's a, just lovely looking across the Danube at the castle and, and having the, the northern light shining in the background. But it actually helps with orbital debris too, because as the sun goes through its natural cycles, these are all of the cycles of the sun since the start of the space age. What, what actually happens on the sun, it's got a magnetic field and the north pole and the south pole on the sun, they swap every 11 and a half years. And so you get a really active cycle and then a quiet cycle. And, an act and when it's active, all that energy hitting the world changes our atmosphere. It actually like pushes the upper parts of our atmosphere up higher. So there's more drag up there. Like it's, if you're flying your spaceship, there's, there's a little more things, little atomic oxygen to run into. And if you took the whole space station and you measured how much is it being slowed down by stuff up there, it's about the weight of a big coin, the weight of a silver dollar. If you could imagine holding a silver dollar in your hand, that's about the amount of drag slowing the space station down. And if you look what that does to the space station, it decays the orbit of the space station. What you're looking at there is height on the left, that on the bottom is 412 kilometers, on the, on the top is 420. So the space station's about 415 kilometers up, and on the bottom is the last two years. And if you look, the space station is constantly falling towards the world because of the drag of the atmosphere that's up there. And then every so often, we fire the engines on the space station to lift its orbit back up again. If you look over the last few months, we've hardly fired the engines at all. And the space station fell uh, seven kilometers down towards the world. So if you don't do anything about orbital debris, and 80% of orbital debris is close to the world in low Earth orbit, eventually, just the drag and the cycles of the sun and the impacts from meteorites and things, they will slowly clean up the environment up there. But it's going to take too long. We need to find active ways to try and, and deal with the problem. So one of the ideas is let's go get and clean up the big pieces. So the big dumb old pieces, like pieces of rockets, so that they don't crash into each other. And this picture was taken within the last couple of months. A company out of England uh, called Astroscale actually launched and flew right up close to this old piece of space junk, a big piece, like the size of a rocket. And all they did on this one was show that their little spaceship works. But next time, they're going to try and go out and actually grab it. But how do you grab a piece of junk? I mean, if I asked you to, to go 
pick up a piece of garbage and you'd never seen it before, if someone said, hey, we want you to go out in that field and pick up the garbage that's there, you'd probably say, well, what's, how heavy is it? What's it look like? And so you'd probably bring, you know, some gloves and a shovel and maybe a rake, or you might even bring like a, a tractor with a, with a lifter on the front, because you don't know. And it's sort of like that. How are you going to grab junky pieces up there? And so you might want an arm like this one, or you might want something with big grabbers on the front like this, and some people are working on that. Some folks are designing one with like a harpoon, where you get up close and you fire a harpoon and it grabs on. And some are building nets, a bunch of ideas. But we need to do that so that our big pieces don't crash into each other and create thousands and thousands of other pieces. But what do you do about all the little pieces? Because you don't, you know, you, you can't launch spaceships to pick up 10,000 things that are the size of your fist. It, we, you'd make more problem than you create. So one of the leading ideas is we build one of these uh, big lasers on the world and we actually fire it and very carefully steer it, correcting for the inaccuracies of the atmosphere. And what you do is you line it up perfectly so that it hits the front of a little piece going through space and it vaporizes it. And that's like putting a little tiny, you know, a jet engine on the front that slows it down. And if you build some of these around the world, you know, that are you know, out where, where, where not a lot of people living, where there's not a lot of air traffic, in the middle of the outback of Australia or whatever, in the high latitudes, in the middle of the Sahara, then, um, and just let them run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, then we can slowly, deliberately start cleaning up the mess that we've created up there of the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of tiny pieces that are in orbit. And we know how to do this. It's just expensive and somebody's got to pay for it and who's going to regulate it and organize it. And regulation is another big piece of it. Um, and this is a picture from the space station of Bratislava. You can see the Tatras Mountains there with the snow on the top. And there's the river and Bratislava, Slovakia, and, and Vienna is in this picture also. And it's a cool coincidence because Vienna is where the regulatory bodies of the world are working on space policy at the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. And they have a group called the Committee for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, and they meet there regularly, and they bring all of the leading nations of the world together to talk about common problems like space junk, space debris. And, and they're working on it. But who's going to actually do the work? How do, we, how do we shift someone to become responsible for it? Well, you could take an existing organization like NACA used, became NASA. It used to be the uh, National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, just for airplanes. But in 1957, 1958, right after Sputnik, the U.S. government said, holy crap, we need someone, not just aeronautics, but space. So they turned it, they changed the acronym, and then now it's the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And suddenly its responsibilities changed. And the people that allow us to have safe commercial aviation um, they used to be ICANN, the International Commission on Air Navigation. Amazingly enough, they started meeting in 1903, the same year as the Wright brothers barely got flying. We already recognized, hey, we need a plan. And that grew and became what is now the International Civil Aviation Organization. They do a great job. I mean, 135,000 airplanes a day, and we're shocked when there's an accident. So what if we could just change their name? And, and they work for the United Nations. They're based in Montreal, but they're, they're, they're under the United Nations. We could just change their name to the International Civil uh, Aerospace Organization. They need more funding. They need more responsibility. But instead of only going up to, whatever, 60,000 feet, they could go up to 2,000 kilometers. So, it, you know, it's not going to be easy, but, but it's some, we got a proven model and maybe we can make that work. And we need our policymakers to address 
some of the other problems, like control who launches. Nobody gets to go to space without a launch license, just like nobody gets to fly a commercial airplane without a license. And it has to meet all of the safety criteria. You know, it, it, if you're going to launch, it can't fall apart as soon as it gets up there. And it has to have a finite life. And it has to have a place it's going to land at the end. And it has to be maneuverable. And there's all of the major space agencies of the world are working with um, the United Nations office to try and figure out how we're going to do that. And we got to stop shooting anti-satellite weapons. That's stupid and destructive. And uh, the U.S. administration a couple years ago under the vice president, she runs the National Space Council, um, they proposed a moratorium on anti-satellite weapons and a whole bunch of countries, including France, have signed up to it. And we, you know, we need that. We, we have to address the problem right across the board. And we also need to rethink our policy. And not just our policy, but sort of like you heard Jane Goodall maybe over the last couple of days here, rethink our role in the world. What should the ethos be? What should, how should the, the heads of companies, the CEOs of companies think about their role? And uh, the King of England, King Charles and I, and a whole bunch of people have been working together through his Sustainable Markets Initiative. And over the last couple of years, we uh, created a document called the Astra Carta. And it's like the, like the Magna Carta, which, which in defined the rights of human beings. Or the Carta Foresta, which a thousand years ago defined um, ecological rights. And this is just what should our ethos be? How can we get better at this? Rather than just thinking about profit, let's think about overall impact. And last June, uh, 11 months ago, we brought 150 of the top space CEOs in the world to Buckingham Palace to talk about these issues. How do we have sustainable operations in space, including the problems of space debris, of space junk? We want to keep being able to take pictures from space like this one that we took of Bratislava. We want to be able to use space for all of our mutual benefits. We want to be able to launch through low Earth orbit to get to the moon and to get to Mars. But don't wait for somebody else. You know, in this room right here are a lot of people that are interested in space flight people that are in the business of space flight, you know, sitting right there in the arena in Bratislava. And it's only going to be people that make this better. And, and each one of us has a role to play. You know, it's why I'm working with a bunch of different organizations, including His Majesty the King of England. And every single one of you has some sort of voice. So. Uh, we need to take this as one of the things that we, it's a problem, a problem that we've made worse. It's a problem that we can help be part of the solution. All the technology exists for us to deal with it. And the whole world is counting on us. Thanks very much.